All right, y'all turn to Luke 22. We're going to resume our study this morning. Um, while y'all are turning there, I'll tell y'all, I always like to let y'all know when something exciting happens, but me and Wayne got to go back to Homa yesterday, so we were really good to see all the saints in Homa, and it was really... Really had a good time and good fellowship, and I just thank the Lord. We've been a long time, a lot of people in and out of that class, and yet still that same faithful few. There, you know, it's always that way. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for this privilege which you've given us. Lord, we come together this morning, above all things, wanting to glorify you. That is our chief concern and our chief duty. And yet you added to that that we might enjoy you forever, and that's also what we want to do. So we ask you this morning to open our hearts and minds and set us free to worship you through your word according to the spirit which you've given us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. First off, I want to thank everybody that uh, was praying for us to get better. And me and Lexi was sick, and I was sick, and I was, I knew she was pretty bad. I was pretty bad. It, I don't mean deadly. Y'all know what I mean. It was just a, but anyway, thank y'all. Thank everybody. And also, let y'all know, Lexi spent all yesterday scrubbing everything with Lysol, so y'all are okay, all right? Yeah. Um, and also, coming back from Homa yesterday, I want to let y'all know, me and Wayne saw El Chupacabra. If y'all, or y'all know what El Chupacabra is? Y'all don't know about that. Well, nobody knows, Wayne. They're not sophisticated like us. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. We're going to pick up the, uh, the narrative today in Luke, and what we're going to be dealing with is the Lord's Supper. And this is such an important subject because the Lord has given us, um, pe some people don't like the word sacraments because, uh, because of Catholicism. I mean, that's why. But the word sacrament, there's really nothing wrong with it. What a sacrament really was originally it meant it was something that God gave to firmly visibly physically establish something in your mind does that make sense mm -hmm. and we have especially two under the new covenant baptism and the Lord's Supper and what it basically amounts to is it amounts to the same thing that Passover amounted to in the Old Testament and circumcision amounted to they were visible physical things that they did in order to bring home spiritual truths does that make sense and when we read this story today, you'll see that the last Passover, Jewish Passover, which we call the Last Supper, don't we? we it's a wonder that, I guess because of the painting, the Last Supper painting, I guess it's become famous to call it the Last Supper. But y'all know, in all reality, it really should have been called the First Supper. Because that which was only a symbol found its fulfillment that night, didn't it? But when we read these things, it's kind of like the key to understanding the Old Testament. The Jewish Passover and the Lord's Supper are so mixed together in here and so inter interwoven that at times it's hard to distinguish certain things. Isn't that how the Old Testament prophecies are? And I always use the same one to, to explain it. When you start reading about the covenant God promised to David, he's going to give him a son, and his son's going to build a house for God, remember? At first, immediately you say, Solomon. And it is Solomon, isn't it? But then it's interwoven with promises pointing far forward, isn't it? And that's the same with the Passover. The Passover was given to commemorate what God did in the great redemption of Israel, right? So the Passover for all those years was looking backwards to the redemption God gave them. But at the same time, the Passover was looking forward to the real redemption because it was a type. Well, we come to the Lord's Supper, and we find the fulfillment of the Old Testament Passover. Boom, there's the Lord's Supper. And right there that day, Jesus Christ was going to fulfill the Passover, wasn't he? Never need to sacrifice another animal. And so he institutes this, this sacrament, this memorial. And the memorial is for everyone to be able to look back and see the great redemption Christ has performed for us, right? But then he also mentions eating it in the future. Y'all see what I mean? So even the Lord's Supper today, it looks backwards, doesn't it? But y'all know what? It looks forward to. Because what did he say? He said, I won't eat this supper again until I eat it with you new in the kingdom. Mm -hmm. 
So it's just like the Lord's first coming and the second coming. In the Old Testament, you can't divide them. Well, prophecy will be, might be one verse, and in that one verse, there'll be elements that are about the first coming and elements about the second coming. Same thing with, with the uh, Passover and the Lord's Supper. There are certain elements that, yeah, just point back to one. There are certain elements that point forward. So if we keep all this together in our minds today, it might help us understand. Okay? <clears throat> now... Um, let's read the text. We're going to read from verse 14. If y'all remember last time, Jesus had them go and get ready the stuff for the Passover. Now remember, they've got to get it and get it ready that day because the next day is a whole high, a high holy day and they can't be doing any kind of servile work. So they get the lamb ready the day the lamb had to be slaughtered. This was the uh, most prominent celebration in all of Israel. Now, why would God even go about giving them things like these feast days or festivals? Let me ask you all this. Think about um, all right, Memorial Day. We have these. We all have them. Memorial Day, right? What is Memorial Day? A day to remember. So we set aside a day where, because lest we forget, we get busy and forget, that particular day rolls around, and on that day we're, we're reminded. We stop, we forget of what we've turned to, and we think about those that have died for our freedom. That's supposed to be the idea, right? Ask a young person, find you somebody 21, and ask them what Memorial Day is about. They don't know. They'll say something like, no school, or post office is closed. I, Huh? A pig roast. A pig roast. <laughs> but y'all know the, the reason that is is because whenever we make a memorial in our country, we just do it as a little token. Y'all know how we do. But what ought to happen in a memorial is there ought to be a reenactment of what took place. Y'all know that's why Civil War buffs, if you know anybody that's into that, they always do reenactments, don't they? Yeah. Somebody said, that's stupid. Why do they do that? No, it's really not stupid if you know the real reason they're doing it. The real reason they're doing it is lest we forget. Right? That's what it's about. Think of the Passover. God gave them the Passover so every year they would stop and they would think, look what God has done for us. And the Passover then was not only a memorial, it was an alarm set to remind them every year, right? But it was also a teaching instrument, wasn't it? If you took your grandkid, or let's say, uh, let's say Chris said, hey, let me take uh, uh, Cian and uh, Gabriel and take them to a, to a reenactment, right? And he takes them out to the reenactment at Gettysburg or wherever. Do you know what they're going to do the whole time? They're going to say, what, why, what are we doing? What is this? Why are these people doing this? Why are we here? Should, and what's Chris going to have the opportunity to do? Explain. To explain, to educate them. And that's what the Passover was. In other words, the Passover was the preaching of the gospel of redemption in a pageant. And it was a reenactment. You know, what do you all think the Lord's Supper is? It's the same thing. And it's a, it looked, the original church, it, it would appear early on that the church did it every week. It looked like they did it every time they came together. We do it once a month on the first Sunday. I know churches that don't do it. We, me and Wayne at a church we went to, they only did it if somebody got baptized and we'd go years without the Lord's Supper at times. That's not what it's intended for. The Lord's Supper is intended to be a constant reminder, a lot like the Sabbath day. What's the Sabbath day for? It's to stop doing everything we've got to do to live in this world. Stop and do what? Hey, wait a minute. Let's remember now. This is about the Lord. And it's that sort of thing. And that's what these festivals are for. So the Lord has had them prepare this. Everything's ready for it. And now we read in verse 14. When the hour was come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. Now, the first thing I would like to point out in this text is Judas was there. There's a lot of confusion about this, and I can understand. If you read all the different, it, it gets confusing, but Judas was there. Judas ate the Passover. Now, Judas does not get to stay for the teaching of the high priest, does he? John 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. But I want to point this out because Judas ate the sacrament. Did it save him? then is there any saving efficacy in it? You see, the point being is Jesus didn't even go out of his way to say, hey, that one can't eat. 
Now, I say this because of things that, that enter into our thinking, and it's so easy for us to get misled and led astray in our mind. You all know how we just we, we get tunnel vision. Um, the Lord's Supper is for believers. There are two people that should never eat the Lord's Supper. Never. An unbeliever or someone that is unrepentant in, in sin. In other words, someone that says, look, I know it is not God's will for me to do this, but I don't care. I'm going to do it. Well, that person has no business eating the Lord's Supper until they've straightened that out and, and confessed and got right with the Lord. If, you get, if you're saved long enough, there will be times in your life where you just might decide, I ain't eating the Lord's Supper. I, I've done it. Just times when you decide, you know what, I have no business partaking in this feast because I'm outside the will of God and I know it. And so what do you do in that case? You don't take it. You get in the will of God. How do you get in the will of God? You fall on your knees and confess and talk to God about your sins. Amen. He, I, I know a, a couple of y'all have shared stories with me where you just felt like you just couldn't eat the Lord's Supper. It happens, doesn't it? It's supposed to happen. I don't mean it, it needs to happen, but that's the way it is. But are you and I required to police the Lord's Supper? No. Never. And that's where churches get in trouble. At the church Wayne and I went to, Wayne, me and you were ordained together, weren't we? Yeah. They ordained me and Wayne one night and, and made us, you know, made it official, right? And then we've got to help hand out the Lord's Supper. And I gave it to some lady's husband, and he took it, and afterwards, boy, I, I had a talking to. I said, and I was worried. They said, do you realize what you've done here? You have let an unbeliever eat the Lord's Supper. And that bothered me. And it bothered me a long time until one day I got saved and later on found out what it really meant. <laughs> but what it comes down to is how in the world, let's just say me, let's say it's the preacher's responsibility to make sure the unsaved don't eat the Lord's Supper. How am I going to know? Seriously. How many Lord's Suppers do y'all think Demas partook of? With Paul. How many times do you think Paul passed the bread to Demas? You see, that's not what it's about. The Lord's Supper is not about us. It's not an exclusive little member's right. That's not what it is at all. The Lord's Supper is a memorial preaching of the gospel to us. And if you're saved, guess what? You never get here, tired of hearing the gospel, do you? And so we're not talking about it's exclusive and beware if someone, because Judas ate it and the Lord didn't stop him, did it? Did it save Judas? No. Well, out the window goes transubstantiation, doesn't it? What is the most important of all the things in the Catholic sacraments? Which one takes center stage? The Lord's Supper. When they don't call it the Lord's Supper, and it's not, they call it a what? Sacrifice. A sacrifice. Can't y'all see why it's at the center of their theology? What do you need to pay for your sins? A sacrifice. Catholicism does not trust the one sacrifice of Christ. They don't even really preach it. Catholicism wants you to trust the church and the priesthood to get forgiveness for you. And anybody with common sense after a while is going to say, now wait a minute, how can this man forgive sins? And what do they say? He makes the sacrifice. Well, what's he going to sacrifice? Bloody animals? That won't go over, will it? So he took, he, they took the bread of a memorial and said what? We really turn this into the actual body of Christ and then we break Christ and then we shed His blood. And unless you partake of that, guess what? You better not die. Yeah, I don't remember exactly how they taught it to us, but Courtney, do you remember exactly? If you die without the sacraments, you're in trouble, aren't you? One of them is those last rites. What's that saying? It's saying if that priest doesn't do it for you, you ain't getting it done. Well, I got a high priest who's already read his last rites over me, and I never need them read again. Yeah. And so it's all, it's all doing things which we're all in danger of doing all the time. It's this. When Moses made the brass serpent, you all remember the brass serpent? The brass serpent was a physical something to visibly show Israel and teach them something. Well, what did Jesus Christ say it was teaching? As Moses lifted up the serpent on the pole, so must I be lifted up. 
So it was showing them the need for a sacrifice for sin. Your sins must be crucified, right? And so we, we see where they did that in the wilderness. And by faith, they lived through their snake bites if they looked on it, didn't they? But you know about 700 years later in 2 Kings, where you find the bronze serpent in the temple. And what were they doing? Worshiping it. What happened? God gave them a teaching aid, and they worshiped the teaching aid. Does that make sense? God gave them something to visibly help them understand faith, and they turned the picture into the substance. Now, that's what Rome did with the Lord's Supper and many other things. Let's me and you not make that mistake. I know people that really are upset if they, they'll miss Bible study. It doesn't matter any time. But if they miss the Lord's Supper, they'll make sure that I know that they're upset. Why? I, I don't like missing the Lord's Supper. I like to take it. But y'all know sometimes some people are never able to attend when we have the Lord's Supper. Is that their fault? No. Are they somehow missing out on Christ? No. Nope. Well, then what's that person that's extra mad when they miss the Lord's Supper doing? What are they in danger of doing? They're in danger of turning that Lord's Supper into something that's more than what it is. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's like this. I remember uh, I baptized a lady one time when we were in uh, church, uh, me and Wayne together. Baptized a lady and she went under and her feet were out of the water. You know, hey, sometimes you just, you know what I mean? And I got a talking to about the fact that that wasn't a real baptism. And I said, what do you mean? The feet were out of the water. The real baptism, it's got, they've got to go under. It's got to bury them. Christ's feet wasn't sticking up out of the tomb, they said. Y'all see how silly that is? <laughs> see, it's something that's just a memorial meant to picture something. It's meant to take our mind to a place of the gospel. And yet, what are they basically saying? That thing is so, if it's not done right, it's, it won't do what it's supposed to do. See how silly that is? You know, someone would ask, well, what form of baptism? All right, when some, somebody brand new comes in, has never heard of Jesus Christ, gets saved, and then they immediately read. They're, they're reading about the eunuch, and the eunuch said, okay, why can't I get baptized? And they say, well, you baptize me. Do you believe? Yeah, well, yeah, I'll baptize you. How? I've been asked that. How? How can I? Sprinkle. I'd sprinkle them. I'll pour over them. If I got some water around there, I'll put them in it. I, it doesn't matter. You notice how vague the form is in the New Testament? Mm -hmm. Don't y'all reckon if the form was the thing, God would have said, A, fill it with this, B. The form doesn't matter. What matters is that it pictures something. Okay, for those that say it's immersion, lots of times I believe it probably was full immersion when it was possible. It's a good picture, isn't it? What are you picturing? I've been buried with Christ. He's washed away my sins. I'm raised to walk in newness of life. Hallelujah. Doesn't that a good picture? The next guy said, no, I like the poor. I like to pour the water and let it run down over you. Does that picture it? Hallelujah. I've had the Lord Jesus Christ has poured His blood on me. He's poured out His Spirit on me. I've been washed. My sins are gone. Does it work? Yeah. Another guy said, no, I like to sprinkle. Hallelujah. Sprinkle them. Why? I have been sprinkled with the blood of the sacrifice. As Moses sprinkled the people with the old covenant, I've been sprinkled with the blood of my sin. Y'all see, that's all it's doing. It's a picture. And so that's the important part. I don't want to make this stretch it out so long, but it's important that we know Judas was there. Didn't help Judas. One iota did it. It never once called to Judas's memory anything, nor taught him. Never in, at any point later did Judas look back at the Lord's Supper and think, hmm, Judas was dead, wasn't he? So now it says, When the hour was come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Now, with desire, I have desired means I am overwhelmed with desire. You know, it says the hour had come. How many times do we read in the Gospels that Christ's hour had not yet come? Constantly. What's he saying here? It's here. He's saying the main point of the entire history of the human race has arrived. Today's the day. 
Folks, that's what this day is. It's the most important day in the history of everything. And here he is. So it says, For I say unto you, he told them, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Now there are two ways that we can take this, and both of them I believe are correct. If you say that he's saying, I won't eat this Jewish Passover again till the kingdom comes. That's true. Because the kingdom's coming the next day. And he would never eat another Jewish Passover. Neither would anyone else that God honored. Did God ever honor another Jewish Passover? Daniel says Christ's death put an end to sacrifice, didn't it? But if you want to make this portion apply to the Lord's Supper, then what he said is also true. Because he said, I won't eat this again or drink this cup again until I do it with you new in the kingdom. In other words, I'll see you, honey, when I get back for the wedding day. And what will we do? We'll sit down and we'll have a feast together. You see, it works either way. And now he says, And he took the cup, and he gave thanks and said, Take this, and divide it among yourselves. Now, one of the things we do when we take the Lord's Supper, we use unleavened bread. Why do we use unleavened bread? Let's say you happen to find some bread that's got leaven in it and you took it. Uh-oh. Are we going to hell? Does it ruin? No. The reason it's unleavened bread, and it's a good thing to remember, is because that's what they were eating that night. In Passover, they were commanded to eat unleavened bread. Unleavened means it hadn't risen. It's still got yeast in it. Don't ever let somebody tell you that unleavened bread doesn't have any contamination in it. The minute you add water to flour, what starts happening? It starts. So it's not that. The thing was that that night he said, get your bread ready and eat it unleavened. You don't have time to let it rise. Get it in the oven and get a meal in your stomachs. We're leaving in haste. Remember that? Matter of fact, the unleavened bread, he told them, eat it standing up with your shoes on. That's the significance, okay? They also had to eat bitter herbs. The bitter herbs were to remind them of the bitter oppression and slavery they had been in. And then they had the lamb. They ate the lamb. But when he says he takes this bread, yeah, it's unleavened bread. And y'all know I like to take one piece of bread and let everybody break off their own piece. If, if we had a more formal way of doing it, if we had the time, I might would in front of y'all break off a piece and then keep passing the pieces around. But y'all know in the day and age we live in, some people would freak out about touching. I don't want Gina touching my food unless she's cooking it. So. <laughs> Um, but I like to break the one piece of bread because what's it remind us? He broke. He broke. When you hear that bread snap, folks, that's to remind my memory what happened to Christ. They snapped that whip on him and beat him and he suffered. That's why the Jews, the Jews had to have the bread had to have stripes and it had to have poked holes in it. That was their cut. They had to do it. They didn't know what that was picturing. I do. He was pierced for me. By his stripes I am healed. But then they also would take the wine, and they would take from the one wine cup, and they would pass it around. There's so much pictured here is that we're one body and the unity of the body, but it's that one sacrifice that's good enough for how many? Oh. Whosoever will. Okay, so this is why unleavened bread. But it says now... <clears throat> He said, Divide this among yourselves, verse 18. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. Now, think, he's saying, I won't drink of the fruit of the vine. He said a minute ago, I won't eat the Passover. Do y'all see the difference? Now it says, He took bread from the Passover and gave thanks and break it and gave it unto them saying this is my body which is given for you this do in remembrance of me likewise also the cup after supper saying this cup is the new testament in my blood which is shed for you okay let, let's go back and really start dealing with this now the first thing is when it says intense desire notice in the back if you go back in 15 he says with desire I have desired to eat this Passover. What's he really saying there? He said this is the great point of everything I've done. Why did he come into the world? For this night, this day. Within 24 hours he's going to be on that cross and dead, isn't he? And he said the day has come. This is what I'm here for. Now go over to Luke 12. I want to show you the same word. Okay. 
In Luke 12, just to give you the idea, verse uh, 50. He says, But I have a baptism to be baptized with. Now let's stop. Is he referring to his water baptism? No, that's already happened. Is he referring to his baptism with the Spirit? No, that's already happened. Then there must be another kind of baptism, right? Folks, baptism means to be uh, identified with something. It means to be, to be put into something. What's he about to be identified with? Our sins, our death. He's going to be baptized into death. See, don't just take baptize every time to mean water. It doesn't. So he says, I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how I am straightened till it be accomplished. He said, I am absolutely just ate up, overwhelmed, focused with this until it's accomplished. I, I can think of nothing else. This is what I'm here for. I came to do my Father's will. He just said the same exact thing about the Passover. When he said, I'm, I'm overwhelmed thinking about this baptism and nothing's going to stop me. I'm straightened until it be accomplished. What's he saying on the night of Passover? The day of accomplishments here. Okay, this is the idea. So he's basically saying all that the Old Testament ever pointed to, the day has arrived. When it comes to this Passover, it's about to be fulfilled. Now, the Old Covenant, again, was inaugurated as symbolic, wasn't it? Why does he tie the covenant to, to the Lord's Supper and to the Passover? Because a covenant is an agreement. Okay? Matter of fact, the very word covenant, the Hebrew word, means a cutting. I know that sounds strange, but that's what it means, a cutting. It's because it's an agreement established by blood. Look, we know about this. You watch it in the Western, and the Indians make an agreement with the white man. What do they do? Just cut their hand. Why? To prove they're brave? No. To, to blood, right? If, if you go through the Old Testament, you see this is what it amounted to. You know, in the, in the old days, marriage ceremonies, when pagans got married, do you know what they would do? They would prick the husband's finger and the wife's finger, make them... Yeah, and this, this is a very common thing. The life is in the blood then what does the blood represent? It, well, it represents your life. Your life is in your blood, isn't it? So when Christ died, He shed His blood. You see, shed blood is the, is the proof. Sacrifice has happened. The blood has been separated from the body. The life, which is in the blood, is no longer in the body. The life is now out of the body, right? Do you all remember when Abraham... Uh, Tell you what, let's go, go back to uh, Genesis 15. God had made promises to Abraham. And Abraham believed and, and is following God. And in Genesis 15, 1 it says... Now after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Now if you tell a man who has no children that you are his reward, what's his first thought going to be back in these days? Reward is a son, isn't it? How can you say this man's been blessed and rewarded greatly when he's got no children? You know when you had no children back there, you were a laughing stock? And what did his name mean, by the way? Father of many. Imagine you run into Abraham. All the nomads coming across meet Abram. And they say, hi, who, how are you? I'm Abram. Oh, father of many. How many are you the father of? None. Y'all see the shame in it? Y'all know how. He... And so God promises him great reward. And watch Abraham's first thought when he hears about reward. Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me? Seeing I go childless, the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. He said, Lord, what is this reward going to be? I don't even have any kids. I mean, I'm an old man. This reward, what are you talking about? And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. Why does he say, I don't have a seed? Because God had already promised him in his seed he was going to bless him, didn't he? And what's he saying here? Lord, it's been a long time. I don't have a seed. Abraham is right there on the cusp of doubt, isn't he? 
How long? Y'all know that's what the big test of faith is, is the patience to wait, isn't it? So he says, Behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir. Your, your butler's not going to be your heir. But he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. He said, I'm going to give you an heir coming from your loins. Now, y'all think logically how all this goes together. What does this lead in the next chapter, Sarah, to say? It's me then. I've got the problem. It's going to come from your loins. It's your child. Oh, okay. Sleep with my handmaid. And, but that ain't what... You see, God's revealing a little at a time. So he says, He brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. He said, Abraham, look up. Now, there ain't a light in the city. He's in the field. Look up. Can y'all imagine what it looked like that night? And he looked up. He said, tell me, old man, can you count the stars? No. He said, your seed are going to be more than that. Mm -hmm. Have they been? Mm -hmm. They have been. And what does Abraham say to this? He should have said, hold on a second. I'm, I'm an old man with no kids, and I might wind up with a kid, but don't tell me I'm going to be the father of a multitude. No. Watch what Abraham says. And he, Abram, believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. It's a shame the, the way we talk when we say to believe in something, we mean to mean it exists. Folks, Abraham didn't at that moment decide God's real. Abraham believed God. God said it, I believe it. And what does God do? He counted it to him for righteousness. Is Abraham saved? Yeah, he's saved. Is he circumcised yet? Nope. Has he still got a lot of sin left in his life? Yep. What's Abraham saved by? Faith in the promise of God's coming Redeemer. I'm going to bring the seed into the world. It's coming through you. And what did Abraham say? I'm waiting. Now Abraham goes on, he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of the earth of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. He said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? Now he's asking something here. Consider, is he a saved man? Yes. But is he strong in faith? Not as strong as he's going to be later. What does he need here? He needs a little help, doesn't he? That when he says, how do I know I'm going to inherit does God say, oh, that's it. You asking me for, forget it. You're cut off. No. What does God say? God says, he said unto him, take me a heifer of three years old, a she goat of three years old, a ram of three years old, a turtle dove and a young pigeon. Folks, that's a type of every, every sacrifice, all there, all of them. In other words, sacrifice. I want proof, God, that this is going to happen. And God said, sacrifice. What's God doing? He's taking a blood covenant, an oath. God's saying, Abraham, I'm going to do it. Is God doing this for God's sake? He's doing it for Abraham's sake. He's given Abraham a physical representation of the promise of God, isn't he? And is it going to help Abraham? And so it says, He took them all in, div uh, in the midst and divided them in the midst and laid each piece against another. But the birds divided he not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. He makes this sacrifice. Look, it, we, we know about this. It's called a blood trail sacrifice. Jeremiah speaks about it. They would Parties would take animals and, and cut the animals for sacrifice. And they would put half the pieces over here to, to burn and half the pieces over here. But then they would have the two parties that made the covenant walk between them. That's called a blood trail sacrifice. God does this. God is going to walk between the pieces. Yeah, he's going to have a representation of himself walk between the pieces. What's he doing for Abraham? He said, Abraham, I swear. I swear. How do you know I'm going to do it? Look at the bloodshed. Now think of the picture. How do I know sitting right here today that I am counted righteous and God is actually going to bring me into that promised land? Because God shed the blood of His Son. Is God going to take that lightly? If God kept His word because He shed animals' blood, how much more so when His Son gave His life? You see, that's the new covenant. And so He says, by the way, I like the fowls. 
There it is. The sacrifice has been made and we're waiting for the effects. And what happens? Here comes the buzzards trying to take it and break it up. You know, when me and you pray, that's what we've got to do. We're offering our sacrifice to God, and what do we have to do? Keep driving the buzzards away in our head, don't we? We've got to drive them away all week. How do you drive them away? By the Word of God. And now it, it goes on, but when he gets down to the end, it says, uh, he tells him, surely I'm going to do this. He also tells him they're going to Egypt for 400 years. But notice it says in 17, It came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. A representation of God passed between those pieces. But it's a smoking furnace and a burning lamp. It's a furnace and a bright shining light. Folks, it's the nature of God. It's the wrath of God and the love of God are going to be appeased by passing through these pieces. And what is this for Abraham? He never forgot it. I mean, any point in his life, if Abraham started to wonder, doubt, what could he do? He could go back and think about that night, couldn't he? I mean, isn't that what we do? We have memorials of all sorts of things. And yet in that memorial, we need to retell what took place, don't we? Hey, why do y'all think people rededicate their marriage vows? He I had a friend that got married and then redid his vows on his third anniversary. Now, I personally told him that's the stupidest thing I'd ever heard of. I hope nobody all, uh, I'm not trying to offend anybody. <laughs> but I told him, I said, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard of. And you know what he told me? He said, we like to do it. And I said, wait, you've done it before? He said, we do it each year. Now, to me at the time, that sounded ridiculous. But y'all know what? Think about it for a second. He didn't have a big party and make people come. They like to recite their wedding vows on their anniversary. Hey, that's a pretty good thing, isn't it? What do y'all think the Lord's Supper is? This is what the Lord's Supper is. Folks, the Lord's Supper is something that God gave to me and you to aid us until the time comes. It's a memorial. It's a feast. It's a celebration. We're told to eat it with joy. But you know what? You don't eat it with joy. How could I sit down and renew my vows with my wife every year at our anniversary while I got a girlfriend? What would I need to do? I need to say, you know what? Enough's enough. If I'm going to rededicate myself to my wife, the first thing I got to do is get rid of her, right? And so what would it do if you and I are, are out, completely outside the will of God in a thing and don't intend on correcting it? Well, don't come renewing your vows to the Lord. Go get that right first. And this is all of this is involved. You know, there's been some of the greatest writing and teaching in church history on the Lord's Supper. And some people will say, why? It's simple. I mean, you write a little article about it, you got it covered. No, you don't. The Lord's Supper encompasses the whole of the gospel, all of it. And this is the beauty of why we're, we, you know, take the Lord's Supper together. Okay, um, let's see. All right, we talked about that. Abraham, we did that. <clears throat> By the way, in, uh, well, I'll tell you what, go over to Exodus 24. We'll just do this first. In Exodus 24, we'll look at something. Jesus said a while ago in uh, Luke that um, it was the blood of the new covenant. Now, what did he mean by that? The Jews understood that perfectly. For me and you, we don't really grasp it the way they did. They understood perfectly this new covenant they were looking forward to. And what the new covenant basically meant is this. Now, I'm not saying the Jews all understood this, but here's what it means. God, back here in the garden, made a promise, didn't he? After man fell, the promise of the seed, right? And so all the way down through the Old Testament, what? Hmm. all the way down through the Old Testament, God is saving his people, isn't he? Is he saving them by some other covenant? He's saving them by the same method he saves under the new covenant. What the new covenant really means is the final manifestation of it, the, the opening of it, the making known all of it. Now, the, uh, the new covenant promise, the new covenant exists before the old is ever added, isn't it? That's why we're told that the old was added. Added? 
Well, what does that indicate? It indicates that something else already existed, didn't it? What already existed? God's covenant of grace. Forgiveness. Huh? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Forgiveness based on what? Animal's blood? Forgiveness based on the sacrifice God said He was going to make one day. And so the covenant was already there. It's called the everlasting covenant. Okay? It's called an eternal covenant. Then will there ever be an end of it? Was there ever a time when it wasn't God's plan? But the manifestation of it to man was in stages. Now, when God saves Abraham, I'll put Abraham here. Paul says, how was Abraham saved? For by grace was he saved through faith. We just read it. He believed God, God counted him righteous. Did Abraham's salvation have anything to do with Moses' law? But Moses' law is added until... It was added until the seed should come to whom the promises was made. So God later added this old covenant. Okay? Now, the old covenant is only old because we've got the new covenant. What we really ought to call the old covenant is the old covenant was that temporary covenant that God put the people under. Did anybody ever get saved through the old covenant? Not one person got saved through the old covenant. Did anybody get saved during the old covenant? Lots of people. But were they saved through this covenant? They were saved this way. Then why was this covenant given? Because anytime you pick a man... What's that man going to start to say? Why me? What, what is it about me? Uh, don't you do it? You bring up election and per anybody that's thinking rashly that understands what you just said when you teach election, they're going to say, wait a minute, that ain't fair. Paul said that's what people would say. Why? Because if you're honest, you say, he wouldn't pick me. Me? No. And so as you begin explaining these things to someone, you begin to say, well, what happened to Abraham's uh, seed because of God's choice? They begin to say, God chose us because we're Abraham's seed, didn't they? And so what did God say? Well, let me teach you something. And what did God teach them with? The law. What did the law show Israel? You can't keep nothing. You ain't ever going to get anything. You will never get anything based on your performance. And yet Israel never got that through their head, did they? But the remnant did. So when God made this covenant with them, what is a covenant? Remember, if I make an agreement with an Indian, what better happen? You better be ready to cut my hand, right? When you make a covenant in the Bible, when any covenant is made, blood must be shed. Okay? It's you, can, you can't ratify a covenant unless the blood shed. Does that make sense? So when Moses enters into this covenant between God and the people, he brings them together. Moses both represented God and the people. It says here in 24, He said unto Moses, Come up unto uh, the Lord, thou and Aaron. He tells him to bring all these people up with him. Verse 3, Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord. And he says, all the judgments and all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord hath said we will do. Did they listen to the words? No. Folks, they, did, they couldn't do it for one day. But y'all know until you've seen your failure, you don't realize how weak you are. So what did God do? He's going to show them. And it says, Moses wrote all the words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning and built an altar under the hill, 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. Y'all see what he's doing? They're going to sign a contract here. This is a, this is a symbolic signing of a marriage contract. And it says, He sent young men of the children of Israel, which offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen unto the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half the blood he sprinkled on the altar. And he took the book of the covenant and read it in the audience of the people. And they said, All that the Lord hath said, we will do and be obedient. 
You know, and, uh, and Archie Bunker told when they, they were talking about his wedding with Edith, and she said, well, somebody asked her, some women's right lady said, well, I don't want to obey in our marriage vows or whatever. Was it in yours? And Edith said, yeah, and Archie asked him to put it in some more. <laughs> <laughs> It, it used to say, I'll love, honor, and obey, right? Well, in the, folks, that's, that's proper. The wife said, yeah, I'm going to be obedient to him as my head unless he's saying me something contrary to God and I'm not going to obey him and I'm not required to. But what's the man saying? I'm going to take care and provide for her and she's never going to go. You see, there's two sides to it, isn't there? But he, they, what did they just say there? I do. That's what they just said. I do, right? But you remember me telling you in the old days they would prick their finger for the blood? Watch what happens. Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. Moses sprinkles blood on everything. What's he doing? He's driving home the idea that this was a contract. It was being ratified by two parties, right? That night of the Lord's Supper. What did Jesus say he was about to do? The same thing. This is the blood of the new covenant. He's saying, look, do y'all remember, fellas, back that when we made the old covenant, which Israel thinks is the end of everything, what did Moses do? Sacrifice had to be made. Blood had to be shed. Or that covenant would never have a start. It couldn't start without it. He said, well, the day's arrived. Only the day that's arrived this time has got nothing to do with Moses. This day, I'm going to shed the real blood. And this real blood is going to ratify the real covenant. And the real covenant is starting now. They were on that day. I know people believe, and it's fine to say, well, the church started on Pentecost in its way it is, but I don't believe that's exactly true. The, the church as it is today, look, the church has always been, the people of God have always been, but the church as it is today in its full manifestation as the bride of Christ, right? When did that boom start? It started that night. He said, here's the cup. I'm about to shed the blood. And he said, from now on, instead of eating a Passover, to remember your redemption under this physical example... Because that's all Moses' covenant was. And what was the great event of Moses' covenant? The Exodus. And so what did they celebrate every year? Being delivered from bondage. Well, what's the great event of history? The real Exodus. The Exodus from our redemption from sin. And so what he's telling them here this day is, just like Moses shed the blood back here, and from that point forward we always remember how we were delivered from bondage through the blood of a lamb. Ain't that how they were delivered? God said, God said this, I'm going to kill the firstborn in every house. Literally, he said, I'm going to kill the heir in every house. That's what the firstborn is. He didn't say, I'm going to kill the heir in some of these houses. At first, he said, I'm going to kill the heir in every house. Every house. But then he told Moses, you tell the people that if they'll sacrifice a lamb, just like I say, and put that lamb's blood on there, then what happens? I'll pass over. Look what he's doing. He's not saying, I'll only kill some of them and I'll let some go scot-free. He said, there has got to be death in every house. Either your firstborn heir dies or a substitute dies for you. So the Passover was, when the angel saw the blood, what did the angel say? Oh, death's already come to this house. Y'all see the picture? It's Christ. And this is what he's saying. I'm about to be the fulfillment of all of that. And all of that comes to a screeching end. This, that night there, did he still know? Would God ever require another sacrifice? <laughs> Imagine how crazy it is when dispensationalists teach that over here in the future, God's going to call the church out. Boom, everybody just disappears. And then what's he going to do? He's going to have the temple rebuilt and Jesus Christ is going to sit down in the temple and they're going to have sacrifices. <laughs> I, I can't believe I ever believed that now. But you know, when you're taught that, you say, well, it makes sense. They start showing you. Why in the world would anyone ever make a sacrifice at any point that God would honor? What would that say? That, person, yeah. that this one wasn't good enough. 
Folks, Jesus Christ said this that night. He said, okay, fellas, here it is. The hour has come. The foolishness is over. The, the dress rehearsals come to an end. For 1,500 years you've been practicing and you ain't got the point yet, so let me make it clear to you. Here's what it is. And that, what is that? That's the revelation of the manifestation of the New Testament. That's why it's called the New Testament. Not because it's something brand new, because it's in its last, final, full form compared to the partial little picture in the old. So when the old is taken away, is the new covenant then added? No, oh, it was there all along. You see what happens? If you take the old out of the way, now all of a sudden you have revealed the true one. Well, what was blocking it all this time? The old one. Israel couldn't see what any of this meant. They were so caught up in all that, right? Now, when you get saved, you go back and read all of this, and what do you see? It don't block you from seeing Christ, does it? You see clearly that this was the point all the way through. All right, does that make sense to everybody? I know we're really taking our time with this, but this is important. It's nothing more important. All right, let's take a break. Wow.